I first learned about Jim Mathis a few years ago. Um, we have a book in our bookshop, called, our, our gift shop, called Bigger Than Ben Her, and Tom actually has an article in here about June. And she's a fascinating person, and I just was really tickled to read that particular article on in this. And then, um, as many of you know, over the last couple of years, we've been focusing on Ben Hur, and I thought it'd be a great opportunity to bring Tom here and talk a little bit about June and what she meant to Hollywood. Um, Dr. Slater was born in Kalamazoo, the one in Michigan. And I don't know if there's another one, but <laughs> <laughs> that's where he was born. Um, and he went to Michigan State for his BA uh, in American Studies, got an MA in American Studies at Maryland, uh, he was a Terrapin, and then got his PhD in English at Oklahoma State. Um, he currently teaches at IU, Indiana University, Pennsylvania. Uh. Um, <laughs> the topic of some conversation at once today. Um, he's a professor of English, and he teaches a lot of American literature and film. Um, he's got an active core curriculum course right now on uh, World War I in film, so um, some interesting topics. He's an expert on silent film, um, screenwriters, and June Mathis in particular has been a real focus for him. Um, he also teaches not only film history, but also um, theory composition. Um, and he's actually doing grading papers right now, so um, <laughs> he's never far from his work. He's won a number of awards uh, over the years, and is um, actually the founder and the director of the Indiana University of Pennsylvania Center for Film Studies. So very, very interested in silent movies as, as well. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Slater to um, tell us a little bit about a remarkable lady. Thank you very much to Larry for arranging this and to all of you for coming. And uh, it's, it's just been great to be here and to see um, this place and, and uh, learn more about um, Lou Wallace and his history and his importance. Uh, Larry just really has a thorough knowledge of it. So it's been great to talk to. So, um, in preparing this talk today, I uh, wanted to do something a, a little different, uh, something different from what, you know, the essay that I, I published in, in that book. And that was the second essay, actually, that I published on June Mathis's work on, uh, um, on Ben Hur. So, I decided to. Uh, include more information uh, about her and um, uh, about her work um, in, uh, that uh, included themes um, related to the ideas that Wallace has in, in Ben and Her that she emphasized or would have emphasized in, in her production uh, that she did in the script. Um, and, uh, and so, um, tell you a little bit more about some of, of her other film productions that way as well. So, uh, we'll get to it here. Okay, and do I have a, how do I advance this? Um, there is a, a little remote that is me. Oh, okay. There's the forward button there. Forward. Uh, should be the one on the right. Okay, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. So, yeah, I titled it, as you can see, um, a woman's Ben Hur, Jean Mathis's approach to the production from 1922 to 1924. That's how long she worked on it. Um, so, um, in, the, in discussing this production, I, I'd like to focus on the roots uh, of it, uh, beginning with Golden Studio, Goldwyn Studios' purchase of the rights from Abraham Erlinger in 1922 and assigning responsibility for creating the film to their new editorial director, June Mathis. And this is a, uh, Mathis and Erlanger. So I don't know when this was taken, maybe around 23 or so. Um, for the next two years, Mathis worked on the script and many other aspects of the production. She cast the main roles, selected the director, scouted, um, locations, purchased the costumes and wigs, hired the crew, and even oversaw the sailing schedules because it was going to be filmed in Italy. Okay. Uh, eventually, 
most of this work would be rejected as she was fired from the production when Goldwyn became part of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. But her now forgotten script deserves remembering for two strong reasons. Mathis would have preserved Lou Wallace's commitments to multicultural inclusiveness and the power of the light of Christ. In this talk, I will show how both themes were important throughout Mathis's writing career and how she gave them prominence in her script. Together, they produced a version of the work that had a distinctively feminist theme because it emphasized spiritual growth over patriarchal order. First, we need to identify Jean Mathis for you. She was born on June 30, uh, 1887, in Leadville, Colorado. When she was three, she began to show an enthusiasm for performing. At age 11, her mother took her from the family home in Salt Lake City to San Francisco, where she began her stage career. Three years after that, in 1901, she began a very successful professional career that lasted until 1914. At that point, she had had enough of touring the country and decided to shift to screenwriting. In, in December 1915, her first screenplay to be filmed, The House of Tears, was released. Three years later, she was the head of Metro Studios screenwriting department. Then in 1920, she received the big break that would give her a huge boost in influence in Hollywood. Metro President Richard Rowland possibly with her urging, had purchased the rights to a very successful war novel, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, by the Spanish writer Vicente Blasco Ibanez. He gave June Mathis control of the production, and she selected a talented young Irishman, Rex Ingram, to direct. She then made a daring choice that paid off big. She chose an obscure young Italian actor to play the crucial lead role of Julio de Noyes in this major production, the most expensive by far in the studio's history. His name was Rudolph Valentino. And in this picture, you can't see too well, but this was a portrait he personally inscribed uh, to June uh, to my dear, uh, what does it say? To my dear and clever June, the only one I owe my um, something fame and and, and uh, status to uh, ever uh, ever devotional, Rudy. Uh, and in wow. fact, when when. Valentino died, uh, and they took his body out to California in uh, 1926. He had no place uh, to be buried. So June Mathis had a family's crypt in the Hollywood Cemetery, and she donated one of the places for her family members to him. Uh, Eleven months later, she also died very suddenly and she was entombed right next to him, and that's where they are to this day. Wow. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, as I am sure many of you know, oh, what? okay, skip the sentence. His performance in, in Four Horsemen made him a star, and the film's success ensured June Mathis's as well. In 1922, after writing four more scripts, for films that featured Valentino, Mathis moved on to Goldwyn. As I'm sure many of you know, Lou Wallace, the former Union General and lawyer, lawyer uh, wrote Ben-Hur here and while serving as governor of New Mexico. In it, people of all races and faiths play positive and important roles. These messages were relevant for a post-war United States struggling with the temptations of rampant capitalism and imperialism 
and the challenges of incorporating cultural diversity. Wallace defined Christianity as a religion with a primary message of love and acceptance, set in contrast with Roman values of militarism and oppression. June Mathis's works from the early 20s share these themes of tolerance and inclusion. Her emphasis on religious tolerance is evident in The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, A Trip to Paradise, which was the first film version of what eventually came the musical Carousel, um, and Hearts Are Trumps, um, which were all filmed in 1921, Blood and Sand and The Young Raja, uh, both also starring Valentino, both filmed in 1922, and The Day of Faith, 1923, where iconography from and references to Christianity, Hinduism, mythology, and mysticism um, were used to present themes of spiritual guidance. Depictions of marginalized others was a key factor in Mathis's achievements. With her selection of Valentino to play Julio in The Four Horsemen, the most important. As a proponent of realism, Mathis would not present a world devoid of racial and ethnic others. Instead, as her films um, uh, with the great Russian star, Ala Nazimova and Valentino uh, show, uh, they were often her main characters. In others such as Ben-Hur, her script for Ben-Hur, and The Idle Rich, which came out in 1920, uh, she worked to include as many marginalized groups as possible. They may not have been presented as equal with whites, but they were present and necessary, a baseline standard for inclusiveness that Hollywood rarely exceeded for the next several decades. A major example of, Mathis, of a Mathis film exemplifying the theme of inclusiveness is 1921's actually, The Idle Rich. The narrative is filled with ethnic characters, all marginalized. Um, in her script, Mathis called for a short sequence of a West Coast immigrant named Sam Weatherby trading with the Spanish, a minor, and Indians, all of whom she refers to in her script as distinct types. In the film, um, Sam Weatherby's grandson, young Sam, has a Japanese valet at his mansion. Then, when he loses all his money and property, an inner title states, quote, with a pocket full of pawn tickets and one suit to his back, Sam found Chinatown the best place to avoid his friends, end of quote. Next to appear are the O'Reillys, Irish, of course. They specifically identify their, their neighbor as Portuguese. Uh, Sam then has an epiphany from the classified ads and starts building a bartering business like his grandfather had by trading with a Jewish tailor and his son. What makes this picture conventional for the times is that the members of all these groups are either servants, the Irish, uh, insignificant others, the Chinese, or customers from whom the Anglo Weatherbees can make their fortune. It is a picture of the ethnic hierarchy of American society and a justification of white privilege. Yet, Mathis included many more groups than had appeared in the original short story, which was in uh, the Saturday Evening Post. True to Lou Wallace's vision, her Ben script, Ben Her script, also emphasizes inclusivity. Unlike any other adaptation of the novel, Mathis begins where Wallace did with the birth of Christ. This choice gives her the opportunity to establish the theme of Christ uniting all peoples. And the examples are with the three wise men um, leaving and being called uh, to Bethlehem. So in this picture, so I don't know if I can make that larger or not, but this, this, this is a, a copy of a page from her script. 
uh, which Kevin Brownwell provided to me. Um, and it was scene 25, 23, so you get an a, a idea here of what movie scripts were like then. And she wrote, uh, overlapping action as the ray of light appears and the angel Jophiel dissolved in and then starts to speak. Thy good deeds have conquered. Blessed art thou, O son of Egypt. Okay, so there's the first wise man. And the next one, um, thy reverence hath conquered. Blessed art thou, O son of India. The redemption is at hand. Scene 40. And then finally, uh, scene 52. O Caspar, blessed art thou, O son of Athens. Thy faith hath conquered. And so she emphasizes that they are coming from all parts of the earth um, to worship the Christ child. Mathis uses the chariot race in Ben-Hur to achieve the same effect. Shots of the crowd show Arabs and Jews separately, but united in their support for Ben-Hur and hatred of Rome. As Masala cheats by using his whip on Ben-Hur's horses late in the race, their owner, Sheikh el Durham cries from the stands, quote, may Allah strike thee as thou hast my, hast my desert beauties, end quote. <coughs> Shortly thereafter, his prayer is answered as Masala experiences his crippling accident. At the same time, as Ben-Hur realizes his impending victory, quote, a gleam of triumph comes into his eyes. God has answered his prayer. His score is settled with his enemy. How exactly they're going to film that, you know, uh, you know, a gleam of triumph. Okay, how do we get that, you know? But um, that's, you know, the ideas that she wanted to get into the film and into her script. Uh, thus, it would seem the deities of two faiths have cooperated in producing this outcome. Characteristically, Mathis then blends in a reference to mythic determinant, determinism in a title following the race. Quote, the weaver sits weaving, and as the shuttle flies, the cloth increases, the figure grows, and the dreams develop. Of such is the fabric of life. End quote. A key statement of this theme is in The Young Raja from 1922, when Valentino's character says, there are many paths, all lead to God. So my point is, these are themes that she used in Ben-Hur that she had been developing throughout her career. Um, and by the way, her choice to play Ben-Hur, her first choice would have been Valentino. Okay, but uh, he was unavailable. Um, he was in a famous contract dispute at the time and not making any movies for uh, June Mathis understood the relationships between the emotions, ideas, the movements of performers' bodies, and the impacts on spectators from the beginning of her career. She began working on becoming a writer in 1913. Twelve years in theatrical touring companies had instilled a knowledge of melodramatic forms with all their aspects of sympathy for the powerless grounded in physical reality and miraculous revelations based on the instability of meaning. She had gained qualities of toughness and endurance. Years on the road, performances in a large number of cities and shows, constant movement from one job into a new one, getting called from Chicago to Saginaw to begin Whose Baby Are You? and from New York to Boston to take the lead in The Girl Patsy, she also had the confidence to put herself in front of audiences and communicate through a physical show of emotions. She knew that gender and sexuality involved greater complexity than admitted to by dominant cultural conventions, and that unseen forces were the most powerful because unlike rigid physical ones, they were ethereal and ungraspable. Finally, as she grew, 
her love of art, literature, and music contributed to a belief in communicating ideas through emotions. Through this physicality of performance, sexual release of being on stage, and the knowledge of how to communicate through these elements, spiritual themes entered Mathis's work. Her screenplays, like much of melodrama, present a world in which the physical and spiritual intertwine. The spiritual is always present, working through the physical to control events, both upholding and confounding social order. The spiritual is a higher realm, but also part of the temporal realm. It is incomprehensible, it is comprehensible, <laughs> and yet mysterious. Most important, people must make their own efforts to reach it, and the paths they might follow are generally most accessible through women. The church scene in 1917's Blue Jeans provides a good example of Mathis's criticism of conservative patriarchal religion. The movie was based on an old play in which an orphan girl named Junie, played by Viola Dana, uh, falls in love with and marries a young man. An elderly couple gives her a home. Later, they will find out she is really their granddaughter. That kind of thing happened all the time in <laughs> Elder. Okay? No big surprise, really. Uh, in the meantime, her husband is rumored to already be married. Uh, so when he goes off to find the woman making this claim, the old couple turn Junie and her baby out of their house. Okay? They all turn her out into the cold. Okay? Um, had a lot of cliches. So in the church scene, Mathis presents women as spiritual figures who offer leadership and redemption. Junie is in her cold, barren apartment holding her baby when she hears the church bells ring. She goes to the church, enters, and sits in the back as the minister is christening four children. But when Junie walks forward, he refuses to christen her child, saying, you have dishonored the laws of morality and caused shock and panic among the faithful. As Junie turns to leave, we see a stained glass window from her point of view that reads, suffer the little children to come unto me. Her grandparents are in the congregation. Jacob, the old man, was insistent about her leaving his home. But his wife, Cindy, always believed in Junie's goodness. As Junie walks away from the church, Cindy stands up to comfort her as she leaves. She then turns to the minister as he prays and shouts the line for him, and forgive us our trespasses. Turning to address the congregation, she says, let he who is out without sin cast the first stone. This use of three sayings of Jesus to reveal the hypocrisy of the men who claim to preach his word is a standard Mathis element. Men of hypocrisy and greed will continue to populate her screenplays over the next several years, while spiritual heroines such as Hasuna, Mali, Juni, and the main character uh, and the main characters of Toys of Fate, A Trip to Paradise, and The Day of Faith would stand out in contrast. I left. Hasuna was uh, Alan Asimova in the film Eye for Eye, and uh, um, Molly was uh, Asimova's main character in um, um, uh, The Red Lantern, 1919, a film about um, the uh, Boxer Revolution, based on you know, set during that time. Um, so, each of these films, all of them written by Mathis, okay. she wrote 120 scripts in her 12 years of work, plus worked on many more that she was uncredited for, plus often visited the sets to oversee things, did editing on various films, um, and so forth. Okay. Um, 
Each of these films incorporates a key battle of the ever-increasing materialist and consumer culture um, between transcendence, spirituality, and imminence, an outlook limited to the immediate physical world. The battle was not simply an empty symbolic one waged in melodramatic film. It was the major struggle of social change of the turn of the 20th century between those who would use the values of faith, family, and independence to justify grabbing as much power and property as they could, and those for whom such values were more important. In terms of spirituality in Ben-Hur, Mathis was again more modernist in her presentation than the NGM film, which finally was made after she was let go, uh, even though she maintained a major element of the stage production that the completed film did not. After years of resistance, Lou Wallace finally allowed a stage adaptation of Ben-Hur with the proviso that Jesus was not to be depicted by an actor, but by a being of light. Mathis adheres to this requirement and builds on it by making light a major motif, a major theme that runs all the way through her script. She does so by starting even before the plot begins, creating a device that would be more expected in an avant-garde work than in a major studio production. Written specifically for the film's uh, presentation as a major event in a large urban movie palace, her script includes cues for musicians and singers and begins with describing the light of the projector hitting the screen as the curtain opens. Okay, So you can barely see this in the first page because a lot of it uh, was ripped away. Now, very slowly a light blah 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 uh, above and we dissolve in the angel Mikhail, you know, okay, in this light. Okay, so she starts with the light of the projector hitting the screen. Okay, um, something that's completely unnecessary, you know, it, to, to put into a script. Okay. Um, the studio exec executives would likely claim that, yeah, cut that out, you know, why are you having that in there? But Mathis was incorporating every element of the performance, even the projector's beam, into her imagery. With this detail, she firmly establishes the importance of people lifting their heads to receive a new light right from the beginning. The narrative begins with the three wise men looking up, receiving messages from angels, and journeying to Bethlehem. Their continual gaze towards the heavens and the lights in the sky signify and awaken the people, anticipating the light that will lift their oppression. As the film ends, Mathis writes, Malach, Simonides' servant, arrives with Esther, Simonides' daughter. Everyone turns and kneels as the light, similar to the effect of the star of Bethlehem, moves towards the camp. So you probably all know who Simonides was. Okay, yeah, the servant from, from the her household. Um, this shot, therefore, at the end, okay, is meant to suggest that the idea of the light moving back towards the projector, out, it grows on the screen, moving back out into the, the theater, okay, completing the circular pattern that began at the very start of the projector's beam. The light that can enlighten the world, therefore, is not just that of Christianity, but of the cinema itself. This is a broad vision, not a claim that the cinema is equal to Christianity, but that it is capable of presenting such a great message. It conveys the idea as well that Christ's message was a spiritual message of enlightenment and not tied to possessions or physical locations of home. Significantly, Mathis concludes with Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, a unique feature of her adaptation. 
all others go on to the crucifixion. Um, the light of the final shot would begin on screen in the midst of the crowd surrounding Jesus and then grow to cover the screen and move out over the audience. Mathis concluded with, quote, the joyous music swells and the picture ends, end quote. Rather than resolving all issues with the hero's physical return, Mathis keeps her focus on the idea of a spiritual triumph that individuals need to follow on their own. What will come next is uncertain, which means that the promise of spiritual growth remains open to everyone, but there is also a responsibility to follow the light. Mathis also again presents her spiritual message through a woman. But daringly, she chose not the sweetly innocent Esther or Tirza, nor the treasured servant Amra or Judah's beloved mother, but the unrepentantly wicked Iris as the conveyor of this message. In both the novel and the stage play, Iris is the daughter of Balthazar, the wise man who first worshiped the Christ child. But she does not accept his idea of Jesus as the promised savior. She is solely interested in personal gain, constantly shifting allegiance between Ben-Hur and Masala to obtain the best situation for herself. Mathis's iris is more human, more complex, and therefore more sympathetic. More modern woman than melodramatic vamp, she shows, quote, great love for Masala, end quote, although he is crippled and penniless. In a key scene, she ironically presents a more Christian attitude than the main character. I think I have this on there. Yeah. Coming to Ben-Hur, Iris begs on Masala's behalf. He did thee wrong, but deeply did he deplore it. Forgive the past, restore his fortune, save him from poverty. She is challenging Ben-Hur to fulfill Christ's commandment to love our enemies. But Judah responds with only contempt and refusal, which may have pleased audiences, but is far from Christ-like. It is therefore appropriate that Judah does not appear in the final shot of Matthew's script. Instead, the spiritual light remains the source of all hope, a theme that blends elements of Victorian attitudes with modern assertions of a greater honesty about sex and straightforward depictions of the dilemmas faced by modern women. Paradoxically, this radical change from any other version may have been motivated by a desire for fidelity to the source. No adaptation of Ben-Hur gives any consideration to Wallace's final chapters in which Judah becomes a leader in, his fledgling, in the fledgling religion. But Mathis's reading of the novel, consistent with the themes of so many of her scripts, may have been that Wallace's theme was not the triumph of Ben-Hur, but the promise of Christianity. Taking Wallace's subtitle of A Tale of the Christ as a major theme, June Mathis, more than any other adapter, emphasized the radical nature of the light of Christ and challenged viewers to recognize it. Thank you. Thought after was she was very specific how she wrote her scripts and her screenplays. Prior to June, they would just say, oh, he walks into the room and does something. <laughs> and June, she walks five feet into the room, he turns to the right, he says this, he looks that way. She was very specific, and that was a way that um, she was able to really control what was presented. And uh, it was very cost effective for the directors and for the studios. They didn't, there were no they didn't have to guess about anything with the June Mathis script. They knew exactly what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She describes that in an, um, 
uh, an article that was written about her in the Los Angeles Times in 1923 was when she was at the peak of her career and her influence. And she says that you know when she wrote her first script, The House of Tears, uh, there's uh, a point where um, the woman in it has discovered that her husband's been having an affair, okay? And she's waiting for him to come home at night. And she described in the script uh, the woman uh, looking nervously at the clock and then looking back towards the door and at the clock again and, and towards the door. And the director said, you can't tell me you haven't been married. <laughs> you know, you know, no, no woman you know, who hasn't been married would, would know that kind of, of uh, activity. And she said, well, yeah, no, I, I haven't been married, but you know, I've talked to a lot of women you know, who haven't been married. You know? And, uh, you know, uh, and I, she said she spent time on subways, too, you know, just knowing down gestures and looks and postures and so forth. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. She was very uh, strong in emphasizing details. So when it came, she wanted to film Ben-Hur in Italy. Yeah. And actually, for any of you that saw the 25 movie last week, almost all of her film was destroyed. MGM yeah. did not use hardly any of it. Yeah. The Joppa Gate scenes seem to be June Mathis filmed work. That's the only thing that made it in the final movie. Um, yeah. But do you want to talk a little bit about what happened in Italy? She had to take uh, uh, the brunt of the blame. Okay. She chose for her director um, uh, a man named Charles Braden. Okay. And she had worked with him before. Okay. And I've seen one of his early films, the only one that exists, and I thought it was it was pretty talented, you know. Um, but he was lightly regarded at the time. But so was like Rex Ingram when she chose him to direct um, Four Horsemen. So um, the crew goes to Italy, okay, and she goes there, and Braben decides that he doesn't want her on the set, you know, and and which didn't make any sense because that was one of her strengths, you know, working on the set and helping to guide actors and so forth. And, um, she, and she'd selected the actors, not just the director. She right. determined the actors. Right. Yeah. She selected Francis X. Bushman, you know, Carmel Myers. Um, her her choice for Ben Hur was an actor named. Um, George Walt, George Walsh, um, George um, um, Walsh. Walsh. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I knew it was W. Yeah, his, his brother was Ra Raul Walsh, the director. And uh, Walsh was very lightly regarded, and, and um, you know, nobody really liked that choice. <laughs> you know, uh, but it, you know, maybe with a good director and well-organized production, he might have done a good job. You know, he certainly looked the part. You know, um, but but Braben uh, barred her from the set. And as as Francis X. Bushman said, Braben was a nice guy, and he was great at telling stories, but he wouldn't do anything. You know, he said we would sit around and drink wine, and he'd tell the greatest stories, and he said. All the time, I never realized he had, you know, hundreds of extras sitting down on the beach sweating. You know, um, they had horrible, you know, um, um, relations with the Italian uh, um, unions. Um, you know, everything just kind of uh, fell apart. Okay, and so MGM then uh, was organized and. Um, a man named Joseph Schenk uh, wrote to Marcus Lowe, who was the head of, of, um, of MGM, you know, and said, um, you know, Mathis, you've got this script that's 1,700 scenes long, uh, and uh, she was responsible for greed, which, you know, she had approved the script of, and, and you know, that's a huge uh, mess that you're going to have to deal with. 
and um, so he put a lot of the blame on her, and she was, um, you know, she was removed from the project and then dismissed from MGM as well. You know, but if you read her script and her notes and you know some of the telegrams, um, she was planning. Uh, she said, I've been very, you know, loose with the numbering here, figuring that Braven doesn't like to do close-ups. You know. But um, through my relationship with Erlanger, I can probably get him to do the ones, you know, and that will help speed things up. You know, and she said, we've got to be careful about, you know, the action dragging because we got a lot of scenes in which you have long robed men walking around and talking. <laughs> so we've got to do something to, to pick it up. You know, and so she was, you know, looking to cut the film already. Before she sailed for Italy, she said, I I've, I've got this picture completely cut in my head already. Okay. Um, but it seems that Braben never pulled things together, and he ostracized her. And then, as Fred Nibble, the eventual director, said later, uh, you had a, a, a Braben contingent and a Mathis contingent in Italy just going at each other. You know? um, so that's kind of what happened after two years of work. Yeah. I actually have a question from one of our Facebook audience. Okay, um, he, he wants to know a little bit about um, June Mathis's relationship with her husband, who was not Rudolf Valentino. <laughs> no, no, uh, yeah, no, he was another Italian, no. Okay, he was uh, a man named Silvano Belboni. Okay, so her name officially was maybe June Beulah Hughes Mathis Balboni. <laughs> her birth name was Hughes. Um, uh, Mathis was her stepfather. Okay, and um, there was a um, uh, director named Carl Brown who had recommended Silvano Balboni to her as a cameraman. And uh, um, Kevin Brown will sent me uh, these notes of his from an interview with Carl Brown. And Brown said, you know, Balboni was really good. He like designed his own lenses and mm. stuff. He was that good. So she hired him. They went, you know, uh, on the um, uh, uh, to the shooting in Italy, and he was very helpful to her as an interpreter. Okay, and uh, they just got closer okay, and fell in love. Okay. And uh, when they came back then, um, they were married in December of 24. Um, and she, he had been doing some directing of pictures in, in Italy uh, before. Uh, so she restored his position as director. He did about three films in Hollywood, but they didn't do well. You know? um, and then when she died, uh, very suddenly, in July of 1927, um, he was on the West Coast, and he was tremendously shocked. You know? um, and uh, he said, you know, um, he, just, he just couldn't take it. Uh, but he was very close to her stepsister and stepbrothers, and uh, they got together to go to New York um, and, and view um, the body there. And then uh, afterwards, he ended up going back to Italy. I had a discussion once with one of June's uh, great, great uh, nephews, and he told me he had met uh, Balboni in Italy, um, and that he was a nice guy, you know. Uh, friends from Hollywood would sometimes stop by again, you know, when they were around there. He said he was there once when um, Stan Laurel stopped by mm -hmm. and uh, did some tar card tricks for the kids and stuff, you know. 
So um, that's everything I know about Balboni, and that um, they really did love each other. Um, June loved her stepsister and, and stepbrothers very much. Her stepsister, Laura Mary, was 12 years older than her. Uh, but uh, she was very, they were very close. All her letters that I had, about seven of them, were addressed to Laura. Um, and um, Laura was her maid of honor at their wedding. So um, that's everything I know. And, and I don't think any of Balboni's films that he directed, you know, um, are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, if the criticism is accurate. Mm -hmm. Now, you said, you mentioned um, her, her niece and, and nephews. Did, are there other living mm -hmm. relatives? Uh, Diane Mathis Madsen. Okay. She lives in Kentucky. Um, Stanford, Kentucky, which I think is uh, near Louisville. And um, yeah, she's been very helpful to me. Um, uh, provided copies of, of letters that June wrote um, when she left Italy, uh, as she was on the SS Homeric sailing home, uh, letters to Balboni and, and to Laura. Uh, Telling about her, you know, feelings after uh, the whole Ben Hur experience was over, you know, and and she said, you know, uh, at that point she just felt relieved, you know, that it was over, um, and uh, she said they're not going to be able to the, to make the movie now that that I had wanted to make, so. Um, I'd rather not have my name associated with it, so I won't get the blame. You know, <laughs> you know? Uh, but her name's still on the credits. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but there's money that comes with the name, so <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. So after she got back, she was not done with the industry. Not at all. No, yeah. no. Richard Rowland was a good friend of hers. Um, was the founder of the original Metro Studios. Okay, a Pittsburgher. And um, um, he uh, had moved to First National and hired her there as a uh, uh, editorial director. Okay, and so again she had um, control of a lot of scripts and a lot of uh, productions, um, and she had some big hits in 1925 comedy hits with uh, Colleen Moore, mm. who was like uh, the yeah. top box office actress mm. of the time. A great comedy actress. Mm. Um, uh, a film called Classified with uh, Corinne Griffith, uh, which um, is really funny, and um, um, I've written, I've published an essay on that. And then uh, she kept working through 26 and 27, but in 26, she had some serious health problems. Um, she had uh, her own four-picture contract with First National to produce what would be called June Mathis Productions. And this was something she had always dreamed of. Now she could focus just on a few productions instead of, as she said, you know, 10 or 15 at a time, which at one point she had had to do, you know. And, um, um, but then, you know, uh, she became seriously ill for a time and she resigned eventually from First National because Colleen Moore's husband, John McCormick, had become a producer for them. And he and Mathis did not get along, it seems. Um, he was demanding changes from her on a script, and she got to a point where she said, no, take it or leave it. He left it, <laughs> and at that point, she didn't have the leverage anymore you know, that she had formerly. So she had the right to uh, Roland and say, you know, I'm resigning. And then for the last year of her life, uh, um, she uh, freelanced, uh, she did some work uh, for MGM, 
and <laughs> ironically enough. Um, and she tried to do two more World War I uh, epics. One was called The Greater Glory, it came up in 1926. And there's a really interesting story behind that, but it um, uh, and then she was, her last script she worked on was called The Enemy, another World War I story, and I found great stuff on that, two drafts of the script that she did. Uh, again, those weren't used, uh, but they had fascinating material in them. It was produced in 1929, I think, with Lillian Gish starring. And uh, then I've got to tell about her death. Okay? because it was pure um, Hollywood spectacle. Yeah. <laughs> she was still working, I think. Okay. She was at a Broadway show called The Squall. Okay. And um, which actually became a movie. It became a movie, yeah. I saw it just a while ago on uh, on online on Filmstruck. And um, so and it was produced by Richard Rowan. So my assumption, uh, my feeling is that she was probably there considering it for a screenplay, you know, for production. And at the beginning of the fourth act, third act, whatever, um, everybody in the audience heard her yell, oh, mother, I'm dying. And she slumped out of her seat. Okay? And um, they took her outside and laid her on the ground. Um, and sh that's where she died, you know. It took the coroner, there's different stories, so anywhere from one to three hours to arrive, you know, uh, and, um, and officially pronounce her death. So this was July 26, 1927, just 11 months after Valentino had suddenly died. She was 40 years old. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, and the strange thing was, it wasn't her mother who was with her, it was her yeah. grandmother. Right. Her <laughs> own mother, her mother had died in 22. Um, and uh, yeah, just a bizarre scene. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we do have some, some live refreshments if anybody wants to visit with Tom. Um, but we do thank you for coming all the way from Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. That was Thank